Welcome to my sixth podcast. Um, this is going to be my fifth AMA or Ask Me Anything, and my second uh, pre written and pre recorded uh, AMA with Andres Lux, my friend in Australia, who I believe needs no further introduction. So if I may, I'll just get down to the questions at hand that he's posed. The first question he asks is, what is metaphysics exactly? Metaphysics is a hyphenation of two Greek terms, meta, meaning after, and physics, referring to the laws of material reality. The term was coined by an editor for Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, who was the student of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. Aristotle's works include long expositions on theoretical, natural, and practical philosophies. His work on practical philosophy discussed ethics, politics, economics, rhetoric, and poetics. His work on natural philosophy discussed physics, astronomy, geology, biology, and psychology. His work on theoretical philosophy, the last in most editions of his series, discusses logic, metaphysics, and epistemology. Aristotle's physics described the four terrestrial elements by applying the terms hot or cold and wet or dry to them. So earth is cold and dry. Water is cold and wet. Air is hot and wet. And fire is hot and dry. In his metaphysics essays, Aristotle speaks in the same terms that 2,000 years later, existentialist philosophers would still be using. He discusses what we have since come to call ontology, the study of the substance of all being and its essence or soul component. Aristotle, unlike Plato, adopted what we nowadays call hylomorphism a 19th century term combining the ancient Greek words hyl for matter and morph meaning to form. This philosophy seems to unify Plato's ideal forms and the things in the world of matter by arguing the universal is within the particular, essentially saying, as above, so below, about Plato's divided line model. But that is irrelevant to us by now. In 2023, metaphysics has taken on a much broader meaning than just what was meant by Aristotle's editor in compiling this section after the section on physics. His second question. How can a beginner navigate metaphysics and separate the wheat from the chaff? my reply. The trail anyone blazes through any field of studies corpus of data for research depends entirely on the desired goal that individual person has in entering into that field. If you want to grow up to be a biochemist, you'd have little need to study geology. And likewise, if your primary interest is in meteorology, you would have little need to study neurosurgery and so forth. So if you enter into studying metaphysics and you want to get something specific out of it, you will likely end up finding a way to twist the concepts to fit your desired outcome. Just so, modern metaphysics has been muddled with postmodern theosophy and ideas about the nature of God or gods, which are not substantiated by the actual data. If you study metaphysics, Expecting to get out of doing so only a broader mind 
and a more well-rounded personal education, then you should read everything regardless of whether you or anyone else believes it to be wheat or chaff. You have to decide for yourself what you will attract toward in your own psychic explorations. I realize, of course, nowadays nobody can literally read everything. That would take too long, be too redundant, and require sifting through too much worthless junk data that is not pertinent to one's purpose in studying the field. But one should decide for themselves what constitutes wheat and what chaff relative to their own personal goals, and to, to do that requires reading some things you might not agree with. This next question. Can you explain the differences between chaos magicians and toxic magicians? And I reply, if you'll indulge me, I'll quote a poem I wrote in my work, The Tree of Death and the Cliffoth, that may answer this question most directly. Then I'll explain it a bit more. Quote, The chaos magician believes there are no rules. The toxic magician knows there are no rules. The magicians are active and passive. The toxic magician manipulates. The chaos magician aspires to manipulate. The magicians are a means and an end. The chaos magician perceives chaos. The toxic magician manipulates chaos. The magicians are the art and the craft. The toxic magician came first. The chaos magician came later. The magicians are the rising and setting. The toxic magician learned how to manipulate sooner. The chaos magician has not yet learned to manipulate. The magicians are the polar extremes. The chaos magician causes and creates chaos. The toxic magician controls and shapes chaos. The magicians are the tree and the seed. So let's break this poem down and ask me just what the hell I meant when I wrote this work in 2003. Firstly, it implies knowledge is active belief and belief is passive knowledge or else the opposite of this. It is only implied and not stated clearly. This implication may or may not be true. It's arguable, but the poem immediately glosses over this and goes on to the next stanza. So next it states, the magicians are a means and an end, but whose end is not addressed. It also does not clarify which magician is which when it refers to them in the next stanza as the art and the craft. It goes on this way, saying nothing, until the final stanza where it states, the chaos magician causes and creates chaos. The toxic magician controls and shapes chaos. The magicians are the tree and the seed. Indeed, the poem at least does not leave it a chicken and egg question over what over which magician came first, the toxic magician came first, the chaos magician came later. So what are the toxic and chaos magicians? Chaos magic is, in modern times, a concept coined by Peter Carroll in his 1978 work, Lieber Null. But it has since it has since branched off into an eight-winged school of thought, teaching specifically, in no particular order so far as I can tell, one, bore, two, thinking, three, sex, four, ego, five, love, six, wealth, seven, death, and eight, 
pure intent magic formats. This clinging need to impose a hierarchy onto chaos, as the chaos magician rightly sees the world as being, is wrong, but not just wrong. It is toxic, a form of pollution, and, as later authors argue, perhaps unavoidable. The toxic magician is, therefore, just as defined by the toxic magician is therefore just as defined by Christopher Hyatt in his work Psychopath's Bible, a manipulator. According to Hyatt, on page 28 of that work, the Christian Judaic attempt to make a human out of a man has failed. What has emerged are two things. One, the web page. But no matter what one says, the web is still the home of the spider. And two, the manipulator. He is the fetus who refused to abort. He is about to happen to you. The reference Hyatt makes to the toxic manipulator, as like a spider here, is very specific for a very deliberate reason. These insect-like entities, some call them the greys, some compare them to the Celtic fairy folk, some associate them with plant spirits from psychotropic entheogenic flora, were a predilection of William Burroughs in his own use of ayahuasca when he imbibed it in Colombia, north of Peru, in the early 1950s. Burroughs describes these bugs as mugwumps, in his works. They may be seen as equivalent to the Mayan underworld pantheon, the Sumerian Anunnaki, the Gnostic archons, and to Jungian archetypes. Simply put, Burroughs' mugwumps are an alien-like, hive mind, single consciousness operating inside many bodies at once guiding and shaping the course of worldwide geopolitical events on this planet for at least the last three aeons. Carl von Eckertshausen, I believe it was, coined the term Great White Brotherhood for them. H.P. Blavatsky called them the Ascended Masters in Seven Ray Theosophy. These are simply toxic magicians. His next question. What are your thoughts on esoteric clubs slash secret societies in modernity? And my reply. Following the 1848 writing of the Communist Manifesto, on into the lifetime of Aleister Crowley, 1875 to 1947, and perhaps even as recently as the fall of Sovietism from 1991. It seemed highly likely the next big thing in the Western esoteric mystery tradition would be a worldwide union called a bund meant to create for all the various sects and secret societies, a kind of communist international or unified body of leadership, something perhaps similar to the United Nations, only for occultists. This plot, of course, has fizzled out, and instead we have been given the internet as a global public forum where all the secrets of all past secret societies become not just public knowledge, but fodder for populist discourse, an outcome many among the progenitors of the Bund concept would have found incomprehensibly odious, including Adam Weishaupt himself. Weishaupt, 1748 to 1830, wanted his Illuminati order to infiltrate Freemasonry, which he rightly considered was, at the time, the closest thing to an international bond for occultists 
and so-called magicians to meet one another and discuss metaphysics. The order of the Illuminati was contrary to the chaos of the hellfire clubs of the era. <clears throat> Although from exile in Gotha, Weishaupt did, leave, Weishaupt did live long enough to see the foundation of the United Grand Lodge of England in London in 1813, marking a nominal end to the Masonic schism between the ancients and moderns of the area. But even today, Freemasonry remains far from being completely unified and farther still from being an effective bond combining multiple differing clubs and groups. In fact, many Freemasons today remain staunchly of the opinion that anything like an initiatory group that is not specifically chartered to practice the UGLE's emulation ritual is strictly clandestine Freemasonry. Although not all Freemasons maintain this conservative outlook, and many Freemasons are also members of other secret societies for studying the occult esoteric mystery tradition. The formation of a working bund today is much like the problem of putting together pieces in a puzzle, the finished picture of which keeps changing. Getting the administrative membership of the modern OTO and York Rite Freemasonry to even recognize one another, let alone agree on a shared constitution of members' rights, etc., as implied by a bond, is almost impossible to imagine now. Nevertheless, that was the impetus for my putting forward the Egyptian masonry degrees, Atlantean democracy, and the Pythagorean order of death material in general. His next question is, between new and old methods to initiate, what is better for esoteric development? The answer only depends somewhat on what you mean by old and new. If you go back to the oldest forms of initiation rituals, still practiced by indigenous tribal shamans, the ceremonies all involve taking a heroic dose of some psychotropic entheogen and, in some cases, going on an independent walkabout or vision quest. Obviously, this is quite different from being initiated into several Scottish Rite Freemasonic degrees in a single evening's sitting by simply watching a theatrical performance of their rituals. The mediation of participation in the ritual activities is only one distinction, however, and not the primary difference. The use of entheogen hallucinogens is. In terms of practicing self-initiation into the esoteric mystery tradition, the usual way to do this is by personal alchemy or experimenting on oneself using psychoactive drugs. Modern psychonauts seek to explore the invisible landscape of the imagination. Many call themselves urban primitives or neo-tribalists, and many these days practice chaos magic entirely without affiliation or else as members of many different kinds of covens. In terms of practicing group initiation into such matters, however, Freemasonry takes a different stance on the use of hallucinogenic drugs during their ceremonies and tends to generally discourage such. This seems to be more of an outgrowth of their Enlightenment-era materialistic scientism than any moral Puritanism. However, as they certainly do not prohibit alcohol or other legal drugs being used among their members. Ultimately, Freemasonry substitutes the imagination and exploration aspect of individual drug-based self-initiation with rote memorization of very specific, mostly pointless, 
lines of dialogue in a ceremonial drama. It does this by making its ego death ritual so unpleasant to undergo, one would not want to do so on any form of hallucinogen. How is the Pythagorean order of death different from other groups? The POD consists of 13 degrees separated into four schools or orders. The entry level of the POD is the four initiatory degrees of Egyptian masonry, each with its own belief system. Sorry, each with its own participatory ritual and knowledge lecture explaining basic concepts about the POD's belief system. The second set of degrees is the Bund, establishing the five major cults of the era as like five equal political parties in an Atlantean society. The highest two levels of the POD are the political and religious wings in Atlantean society. The political wing is based on Atlantean democracy, a global Senate of 23 members with seven chief executives among them and no army. The religious wing deals with the Lemurian church bank system, voluntarily monitoring the use of free energy or psi among its members. There are some cursory similarities between the POD and other groups, such as between the four Egyptian masonry initiation rituals of POD and the three of Blue Lodge Freemasonry. The division at its top cast between political and religious wings, as in the Illuminati of Adam Weishaupt, and even borrowing the concept of a bund from the OTO. However, in looking at these apparent similarities in more detail, one will quickly realize there are more differences than commonalities. Indeed, the Egyptian masonry rites of the POD cannot rightly be called clandestine Freemasonry because they are entirely unique from any of Freemasonry's rites and even any other prior system. Likewise, the terms Weishaupt meant by government and religion are vastly different from what those the, from those the POD outlines. And finally, of course, the OTO's idea of itself being the bund would naturally be incomplete without including other cults as equal political parties as in the POD. His next question. <clears throat> Has the ethnopharmacological search for psychoactive drugs improved or impeded human development? And I answer, the search for psychoactive drugs has defined the course of human development. Whether you believe magic mushrooms explain the missing link between Homo sapiens and earlier species of hominid or not, the evidence remains from anthropology and archaeology that the earliest city-states centered around the cultivation of crops for producing a tincture we nowadays know only from its name in ancient texts, Soma. According to these scriptures, Soma was a potent hallucinogen, although its ingredients remain lost to us today. Many plants and some animals around the world contain psychoactive chemicals and different classes produce different types of effects. Acacia, for example, is a globally common tree that contains DMT, the psychoactive ingredient in Peruvian ayahuasca. There is a modern scholarly theory that different methods for ingestion of the same or similar classes of drugs 
resulted in the different methods for resulted in the different types of cultures that have evolved independently of one another around the world, as well as led to almost all wars between them. For example, sniffing or drinking, smoking or eating, and the different classes being stimulants, hallucinogens, analgesics, etc., even tea and spice trade has led to wars when supplies get too low or too expensive. His next question is, intuition is often wrong, according to Daniel Kahneman. Can you train your intuition, or is it better to rely on second-tier system two thinking and logic, etc.? And I reply in brief, it could be argued that the proper way to train intuition is by applying logical thinking. Even if your intuition never improves, at least you'll still be thinking logically. He asks, is the history of the human race hidden? And I reply, firstly, Humanity is a species, not a race. Secondly, the Homo sapien species has supposedly been around some 300,000 years, and we've only been behaviorally modern, wearing clothes, using our throats to communicate sounds, making flint arrowheads, and taming animals. For the last 160,000 years or so, so, for roughly half the time human beings have existed, we saw fit to live as nomadic savages, dwelling in caves, and hunting migrating herds of bisons and mammoths. Nowadays, of course, almost all the history of human thought, technological development, etc., from 300,000 years ago until 160,000 years ago, has been buried beneath the dirt and has to be dug up in order to be understood. It is known that until about 130,000 years ago, the entire human species was contained in the continent of Africa, and it was not until this time that early people began to migrate into distant lands, such as Eurasia by 125,000 years ago, Australia by 65,000 years ago, the Americas around 15,000 years ago, and reaching the remote islands of the Pacific Ocean only as recently as 1280 AD. Since written record of human history only dates back as far as the invention of writing, or to Sumerian cuneiform some 5,000 years ago, or around 3,000 BC, the entire prehistory of humanity from its birth around 300,000 years ago until we invented writing, a span of some 295,000 years, is lost. As Napoleon Bonaparte put it, history is a set of lies agreed upon, but his was a very cynical outlook in that regard. Rightly, history should be considered a set of conjectures and best guesses that is always evolving with new discoveries. His next question. Are you familiar with Ken Wilber's slash spiral dynamics models and non-linear leaps in human consciousness? And I reply, I'm familiar with how time works regardless of who says what about it. A good model for explaining how time works is a screw. We exist on the surface of the screw's thread. The screw is always rotating so that the surface below us is ever shifting. The screw's thread rotates such that we would be pulled downward with it if we remained inert and motionless. Instead, we are forced to struggle uphill 
against the downward spiral of time as entropy itself. We have to struggle to survive, to succeed in society, to breed the species, and to create new ideas. But ultimately, everybody dies and entropy wins. Using a circular model for a calendar, one can measure this spiral by aeons of 2,000 years each. In such a model, we would be entering the age of Taurus following the age of Gemini. The age of Taurus in the North Hemisphere constitutes mid-autumn in the Ice Age duration seasons of the aeons. Studying this cycle indicates that we will likely be entering into another North Hemisphere Ice Age in around 4,000 to 6,000 years from now. Understanding what causes this cycling climate pattern as part of the larger model of space weather is actually far more important than simply recognizing that time is screwing you. This next question. Are we in an epoch where we may see this nonlinear jump now? And my reply, nonlinear jumps in human consciousness occur for apparently random individuals or groups at unpredictable times in history due entirely to unprecedented and unique events that likewise could not have been planned beforehand. Sadly, this is also usually associated with, with trauma to that individual or group. Whenever a person has, historically, stuck their neck out above the herd, the flock, the masses, etc., they have gotten their head chopped off. Civilized people self-censor and keep their heads down, finding safety in numbers among cowards preferable to the risk of being singled out by history as someone who would seek to change its future course in the here and now. When one tries to use magic as a shortcut to manifestation, one bends reality and breaks natural law, and if one does this, reality tends to push back with an, albeit slower, but much stronger force against them. His next question. Panspermia, panpsychism. Do you subscribe to either with the current evidence? And I go on to reply. I subscribe to both, but not to the extent I think one may be related to the other. So the only thing panspermia and panpsychism definitely have in common is the prefix pan, which in both cases just means trans or cross, as in panspermia, the cross-fertilization of planets by interstellar seeding of life forms or their elements via comets, asteroids, etc. And as in panpsychism, the a priori transcendence of mind over matter. Panspermia may be responsible for the origins of DNA-based life forms here on Earth insofar as an RNA-like alien virus may have crash-landed here during the Archeon period and begun arranging the single-cell, heat-feeding, complex carbohydrate molecules in the lava ducts there into the earliest microbes. There's certainly circumstantial evidence to speculate that the earliest eukaryotic cells, dating to at least 2.1 billion years ago, split from the existing forms of prokaryotic cells, to quote Wiki, by symbiogenesis between an anaerobic Asgard archaeon and an aerobic protobacterium, which formed the mitochondria. 
a second episode of symbiogenesis with the cyanobacterium created the plants with chloroplasts. The cause of these cases of symbiogenesis remain speculative. The causes of these cases of symbiogenesis remain speculative. Panpsychism can be explained, in my estimation, thus. The ego, or central self-concept, in the individual local mind is like a drop of water. And the universal mind, or non-local cosmic consciousness, is like an ocean that this ego dissolves into and dissipates in more the larger it expands its encompassing area. That is, the individual's mind may expand to include a vast amount of knowledge, but this will necessarily always be less than the ineffably infinite amount of knowledge that exists or that let alone can exist. So although the individual mind may expand to some extent, it remains merely an isolated subset within the luminiferous ether field of hyperspace zero-point energy that extends beyond even the four-space shape of the space-time continuum itself. Insofar as this sub-quantum energy field is reflexive to the influence of the individual ego, it demonstrates that the local mind of the ego and the non-local mind of God at least share the same essential substance as a common medium between both. His next question. Is there such a thing as forbidden archaeology? And do you know of examples that have been discovered and hidden from the public eye? Yes. My answer is yes. Even in our lifetimes, there's been politicized debates that have interfered in unbiased archaeology. The most popular, or at least most popular, or at least most publicized, was the debate between British archaeologist Graham Hancock and Egyptian archaeologist Zahai Hawass over the efficacy of ground-penetrating radar to probe the sandstone below the Sphinx. Hawass denied its usefulness and shouted Hancock down during a public conference in an event that quickly became viral video in the modern era of the internet. This is not a new trend in archaeology either. Consider the debate, mainly carried out during the 20th century by their followers, between English Egyptologist for the British Museum, Sir E. A. Wallace Budge, 1857-1934, and English poet, Egyptologist and spiritist Gerald Massey, 1928-1907. While Budge remained the go-to for scholars of English translations of Egyptian hieroglyphics during most of the latter half of the 20th century, Massey was preferred by theosophists and many indigenous peoples who particularly identified with Massey's explanation of Jesus' acts in the Gospels as a retelling of the resurrection of Osiris from the perspective of Horus and favored Massey's Christian socialism. The result of this split between the style of study used by these two pillars of early 20th century English Egyptology was that, for the latter half of the 20th century, many people studied one or the other of them, but few studied both. Budge stuck with a purely phonetic translation of the Egyptian hieroglyphics, but Massey, supposedly, read a deeper meaning into the pictographic nature of the letters. So, while Budge was studied openly by public scholars, 
Massey was often studied esoterically by more speculative researchers. The result of this is that there are hypothetical conclusions proposed by both Budge and Massey that are not shared in the works of the other. This competition within the field, even over simple English translation of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, only serves to obfuscate the truth about history and enshroud it in the trappings of modern thought. <clears throat> His next question is, what does the Tibetan Book of the Dead describe, and is it the best source for understanding bodily death? And my reply is, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Bardo Total, describes the essential features of the Buddhist afterlife. Almost immediately upon death, one will perceive the primary clear light of utmost consciousness. Described in the work, as quoted from David Lynch's TV series, Twin Peaks, more or less thus. Leland, the time has come for you to seek the path. Your soul has set you face to face with the clear light, and you are now about to experience it in all its reality, wherein all things are like the void and cloudless sky, and the naked, spotless intellect is like a transparent vacuum without circumference or center. Leland, in this moment, know yourself and abide in that state. Look to the light, Leland. Find the light. Into the light. Into the light. End quote. If the soul clings to the body and cannot allow its ego, as we understand it in the West, to dissolve into oneness with this primary clear light, then the soul will likely enter into the bardo realm of reincarnation, defined by the six lokas, or types of being one can reincarnate as. One, a deity. Two, a jealous god, three, a human, four, an animal, five, a hungry ghost, or six, a demon. The longer a soul lingers in the material physical realm after its bodily death, the lower it sinks in this bardo realm. And it continues to reincarnate forgetting its past karmic lessons with each death and rebirth indefinitely. Finally, in the last bardo realm, between death and rebirth, the soul is plagued by visions of wrathful deities that erase its last life's memories. With or without the bardo realm of reincarnation, The distinction of the primary clear light being the first experience a soul has after its body dies sets the Tibetan bardo total apart from its Egyptian counterpart, the book of coming forth into the clear light of day. In the Egyptian book of the dead, a soul immediately proceeds to the experience of the weighing of the soul as soon as their body dies and may only proceed to the island of Osiris by crossing the Amduat, the Egyptian river Styx, following this event. Insofar as the island of Osiris may be the closest proximal similarity to the Buddhist primary clear light bardo, both being the realm of the utmost consciousness, this distinction of which event comes first the light or the judgment following death remains massively significant.
And his next question, the starseed hypothesis, does it have any credibility? <clears throat> and my reply to that is, in ancient Sumer, the group of half-alien hybrids were referred to as the Nephilim, among other names, and associated with the Igigi, or supposedly Martian stationed Nibiruans. In the Akkadian Atrahasis, these Igigi are tasked with building a water course and rebel against the Anunnaki in Leo, their taskmaster, lighting fire to their tools in history's first recorded labor union strike. As a result of this dispute in the myth, the Anunnaki decide to create mankind as an agricultural laborer to serve them. In the Hebrew Torah of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it states of this antediluvian era, the Nephilim giants were in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in, to, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. The same were the mighty men that were of old, the men of renown. Here, the sons of God are usually interpreted to mean the fallen rebel Anunnaki gods, or the Igigi of Mars, who sired the Nephilim as half-breed giants on the daughters of men. Nowadays, star seeds are the term used by the New Age believers for supposed half-breed offspring sired on human women by the gray aliens popular nowadays. These gray aliens are described in a similar enough way to European Dark Ages fairy folk and to the Lilin, or baby-snatching demons of the night hag Lilith in ancient Babylon, that they may be seen as a modern, demonized understanding of the once noble Anunnaki gods. However, the hybrid offspring of these gray aliens with human abductees appears to be a phenomenon more closely related to the conspiracy theory of reptilians rather than of indigo children. Also, the malformed star child skull from southwest of Chihuahua, Mexico, of a four or five year old child who died as a result of congenital hydrocephalus only serves to obfuscate the authentically ancient and worldwide practice of artificial cranial deformation or skull lengthening. In fact, the resemblance between the Kurgan culture's long skulls from the Black Sea region and the depictions of the seven Apkalu fish-headed or winged sages of ancient Mesopotamian religions is, although often overlooked, a fascinating similarity. And the editor's next question, what are your thoughts on Israel Rigardi? And I answer, Israel Rigardi's work compiling the complete Golden Dawn initiation rituals and knowledge lectures into the big black brick edition we have now is indispensable. The original Golden Dawn manuscripts having been written in a cipher designed by German abbot Johann Trithemius in his 1499 work Steganographia, Rigardi's work in publishing an English translation of the rituals contained therein is extensive and beneficial enough, but including the knowledge lectures of the earliest resurgent Golden Dawn members goes even further in elucidating how these rituals were received and what ideas were invoked by their practice. In so far as the nature of these knowledge lectures becomes more and more complex throughout this work, it stands as evidence for this course of ritual classes, at least expanding the minds and increasing the intellects 
of those who read, studied, and practiced them. The fact Rigardi parted as Aleister Crowley's secretary on amicable terms with the great beast also speaks monumental volumes as to Rigardi's personality. I think Rigardi was an honorable person. His next question. S.L. McGregor Mathers. What useful contributions has he produced, and have they impacted your own work? And my answer is, S.L. Mathers' work as Frater S.R.M.D. in Rigardi's Golden Dawn book is absolutely integral to any study of Neo-Enochian material, which is included in my own work on the Atlantean calendar. Mathers assigns the Tetragrammaton letters to John D.'s Enochian Watchtower's model as symbolic of the four terrestrial elements, earth, air, fire, and water. He then arranges these along the uppermost rows of each of these watchtowers, sub-angles, and along their outsides as columns, such that, by crossing these elementary letters, one could arrive at the twelve zodiac signs. Thus, Aries equals fire of fire. Virgo equals, excuse me, Aries equals fire of fire. Taurus equals earth of water. Gemini equals air of air. Cancer equals water of fire. Leo equals fire of water. Virgo equals earth of air. Libra equals air of fire. Scorpio equals water of water, Sagittarius equals fire of air, Capricorn equals earth of fire, Aquarius equals air of water, and Pisces equals water of air. Understanding this system is absolutely essential to understanding my own Atlantean calendar model. And his last question for now. If thoughts aren't local, where do they transmit from? And my answer is, most civilized people's self-originating thoughts are vulgar, stupid, incomplete portions of their inner dialogues and arise primarily from the reactive id. On top of this, the imagination may wander non-locally and explore astral realms beyond the immediate conditions of their own situation. This experience is what Einstein referred to as a mental laboratory, wherein he could perform any hypothetical experiment he could dream up. It was also from this realm of the subconscious that Auguste Kekulier pulled forth the ring structure of benzene, from a dream about an Ouroboros, a snake eating its own tail. Beyond these limiting distractions that keep one bogged down in the quagmire of immediate material reality, and the unlimited realm of inspiration above and beyond even this, there yet exists the hyperspace field of zero-point energy or the so-called luminiferous ether, that may be explored by mind expansion. The local mind and this non-local energy field are of the same essential substance. Insofar as the human brain can process information faster than any extant quantum computer, it remains capable of receiving pulsed signals of information via this sub-quantum field. Distinguishing between psychic pollution or the noise of all useless thoughts in this local ether and such actual pulsed signals of information 
is the first step toward tracing is the first step toward tracking down the source for both of them most psychic noise comes from people's own brains while most psychic signal comes from people's hopes for a better possible future so that's it for my sixth podcast i hope you've all enjoyed and thank you for tuning in uh i'll catch you on the flip side have a good one peace